one name above all names, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. And it is in his wonderful name that I greet you, I welcome you, and we have a union in faith that if you're listening to this and you've trusted alone, and when I say alone, not 15 other things that you have to do, but you've trusted in Christ alone to have died for your sins, been buried, risen again, and you believe your personal sins were on his heart and mind and were part of his death, then do you know what? As I welcome you, as I maybe talk to you, and maybe this will be on internet in 10 years' time, I don't know. But if that be so, then you and I have a union, and that is through the Holy Spirit, where we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Spirit. And, of course, we are together for all of eternity, whether I've gone there and you're waiting, or you've gone and I'm waiting, we will be together because that is the unity in Christ. And on that basis, I personally am not a big organization person, because people become too associated with the organization, they may have conflict with another organization, and they don't see eye to eye, not on the basis of biblical understanding and truth, but sometimes for other reasons that are not so important. So I mention that as I start, and I welcome you, and enjoy our time together today, and with Christ's help, believing correctly, which is doctrine, it's trusting things you believe, because you have examined them and tested them, and they are true, and true equals truth, and truth equals, what does it equal? Truth equals facts, and facts equal, you anchor to them, they work in your life. And you know what's quite interesting about that? Is that the word doesn't effectually work in your life unless you have got it not only doctrinally correct, and listen to me please yeah, but you've got it dispensationally correct. In other words, you're not taking instruction written to Moses and trying to apply it today, not because it's not because it's too old, but because God introduced the gospel of grace through Paul the Apostle. And his 13 books that begin with the word Paul, that's where we're going to find the truth that liberates us. I'm also, and I must say that I am honestly and truly overwhelmed by the glory of the scriptures since I've applied them more accurately and more, um, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for, more realistically in the teachings that are rightly divided is the word we use. To just forgive makes no sense. That's why Christ had to pay for our sins. And many people think you must just forgive. No, you can only forgive when a person actually has come to know Christ not personally, but in the sense of God's forgiveness doesn't operate until that happens in their life. And therefore their motivation and their person and their identity and the reason they live is not correct. But I want to do a comparison here, and that is the Lord's Prayer. You can see uh, the Lord's Prayer of Matthew 6 is an old principle. When Jesus Christ spoke on this earth, he was talking to a kingdom prospect and the people that would be within it. Um, and there's so much on that. I promise you, if you've not heard it and it doesn't make sense, I promise you the pennies will drop so quickly you'll actually wonder um, where they came from. But Matthew 6.12 in the Lord's Prayer it says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, if we left it there, we'd sort of look at that and say, okay, so God's going to forgive us as we forgive our debtors. Now, debtors and debts normally relate to money, but they're also emotional, moral, personal hurts, etc., etc. And of what, what's interesting to me is what the Lord says to Peter. And look at this. Matthew 6, 7 is addressed to who? And listen to this. And this is dealing with the Lord's Prayer as it's known. That's why I put it in inverted commas because it's not the Lord's Prayer, number one. Number two, it's not the words you should be praying. The principles are there. And number three, the principles relate to the kingdom on earth that Jesus had come to establish to the nation of Israel, not to you and me. Now, you may be saying, oh, I promise you it's the truth, and I'll go to my grave not only believing that, but knowing that because God's word is so clear on it. Okay, let's have a look at who it's addressed to. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Ah, so they use vain repetitions. Why? And listen to this. For, that means because they think, and I've also highlighted that, 
oops, I think that's poor doctrine because it's thinking and they thinking not on the word of God, not on the truth of scripture, but they thinking on what is poor doctrine. You got that? And that's why doctrine is so key because they were just believing something that was not biblical, not scriptural, and it was not the doctrine of the Bible. And doctrine is simply teaching and it's correct teaching. And interestingly, Jesus speaks to the Pharisees and he says, your doctrine is wrong. In other words, it's not biblical doctrine, but it is doctrine because it's teaching and it's wrong. And then it says that they shall be heard for their much speaking. What is that talking about? Vain repetitions over and over and over and over. They praying to their gods <clears throat> as they did even in the Old Testament many times. They were not accurately believing correctly. But what did they do? He says, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for or because of their much speaking. Now, my friend, you might have been, you might know of, you might be connected to someone who says, if you want forgiveness, what you have to do is say the Lord's Prayer 10 times and you need to say the Hail Mary 10 times and God may forgive you. You wouldn't treat your three-year-old with that kind of intelligence. So please don't think that God says, oh, they're repeating this is a good idea. No, 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 no. He says vain repetitions are the heathen's way. God knows what we are actually requiring before we even ask for it. And it says, be not therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. And then look at Matthew 18, 21 to 22. What does Peter say? Peter comes to Jesus and says, and it says, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft should my brothers, my brother sin against me and I forgive him? How many times must he sin against me and I just keep on forgiving him? Till seven times? Can he do it seven times and then there's a problem because I don't forgive him anymore? Done it seven times? Now remember, this is a kingdom principle. Very different. They were going to be a people on earth living in an earthly place where God blessed them. And it was not the physical world that we live in today. But he says, Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee. You see that word, not? I say not unto thee, and thee is a singular, not ye, which is plural. But he says, until seven times, but until 70 times. I say not unto thee until seven times. In other words, not seven times, but until 70 times. So that is the kingdom principle versus what we have today. The New Testament, the new contract. Read Hebrews 9. It tells you the death of Christ uh, up until then, even to the Jews. There was no new contract. There was no last will and testament, if I can put it that way. So the New Testament hadn't even begun at, at Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. It's just a, it's just a, a practical thing. It's, but the, the, the New Testament, the new covenant with Israel began at the death of Christ because they wouldn't sacrifice a lamb anymore. That's one of the reasons, but there are many others. So the New Testament speaks of the truth of Christ revealed to and through, to and through Paul's letters to us. One is conditional, which is the Old Testament and what we've just been talking about, even what's known as the Lord's Prayer. It's not the Lord's Prayer. It's the Lord's wisdom on how they were to pray. So one is conditional and the other is liberal. And then Paul writes when he shares this message over the years that he does, and he writes the 13 books, and he says on occasions, and I'm sharing this, do not use your liberty because you have been forgiven and you've experienced grace. And God says, you know what? You don't have to forgive for me to forgive you. I beg your pardon? But doesn't it say, as you forgive others, so you shall be forgiven? No, 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 no. He says, I forgive you independent. If you don't want to forgive, don't forgive. Now, I'm adding this, but you may be one of the most bitter people I'll ever meet because when you have a lack of forgiveness, can I tell you, you are the person that lives without any liberty and you are the person that lives in, excuse the expression, a bitter and twisted mind within your thinking. And that's why Paul writes and he says, but know the liberty. He says, you, can, you, can, you don't have to forgive to be forgiven. Now, many people think you do. No, it's not in human nature to forgive. It's only divine that God should forgive us that we have been forgiven and therefore we can forgive. 
and listen to this. And I hope that you're listening to this because I promise you, I'm going to make you an absolute definite statement. Can I tell you, before you take your last breath, you're going to need to forgive because you are forgiven. In other words, we don't get through life without trauma. We don't get through life without hurts. We don't get through life without people misunderstanding us. And some of them just go for us and milk us, and they know they're guilty. And you know what the Lord says? And this is a, this is a con contextually out of place quote. It says, allow them to defraud you, for God is a God of vengeance. You may remember in Matthew 12, the Lord Jesus Christ says to the Pharisees, every idle word you shall be guilty of in essence. Okay, but Galatians 2.4, the grace that we know is so beautiful, and listen to this. Galatians 2.4, Paul's writing to the Galatians. They were people who wanted to go back to the law, and Paul says, who hath bewitched you? He says in Galatians 2.4, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in. In other words, they weren't aware that there was a problem with these guys coming in, and they had to face the consequence, but it says who came in privily. In other words, they came in, uh, we would say slyly, or maybe uh, uh, covertly, but it says who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. Do you have liberty? Or are you locked into the unforgiveness that's burning your soul to pieces? And God says, what are you doing? Don't you think I'm capable of working it out? Yeah, you're going to, be, you're going to have shortcomings by the millions. Jesus Christ came as the Son of God, the Son of Man, and he got put on a cross. Have you ever had anybody be that cruel? Have you ever had anybody be that destructive in your life? That they beat you, they whipped you, they humiliated you. And you know what, if we had that? We're sinners. We're not worthy of any more than that because hell would have been a very, very much worse place than what anybody could do to us. But Jesus Christ never deserved that. So who is it who brought our liberty? And was it fair? No, it wasn't. But it was his grace. And he paid a price because, as I said at the beginning, forgiveness requires justice. But we never paid the price. Jesus Christ did. But we are the beneficiaries because justice dealt with the sin. Because Adam brought sin in, and by his disobedience, many became sinners. But by Christ's obedience to the cross, when he died for us, to pay the price before God for God's wrath, you know what happened? By one man's obedience, many are made righteous. All were made sinners but only many are made righteous. Why? Because you have to believe in him. And when you do, you know forgiveness like nobody knows. I had somebody speaking to me about this the other day. And you know what? They were blown away by it on how beautiful and how liberating God's justice is and his love and how he met that. When you speak about the gospel, can I tell you something? When you share it, it refreshes you from the inside. And that's why I say, when we start to get amped about the scriptures, excuse the word amped, but enthusiastic and excited, we speak about it. And you know what? Every time we speak about it, it has to go through our mind. Paul writes this difference, and he says, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. When a person has been liberated, bondage is not the issue. They've been freed from the bondage. And then he also writes and he says, and by the way, that's the gospel of grace he's talking about. And then he says in Galatians 5.1, he says, stand fast. In other words, be unmovable. Don't budge. Now I'm going to say something to you that I hope you understand, but I promise you it's the core of my thinking now. And that is many people say, well, I believe this and I stand for that. And they talk about the truth of the scriptures. And you know what I'll say? The measuring rod of your faith is not what you believe for. It's not what you stand for. And those of you who know me know what I'm talking about here in terms of how powerful and how accurate this is. And that is, I measure a man's faith by what he fights for. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Remember in the previous one, he also said, and I'm going to go back there, that might bring us into bondage. He says, I've freed you from the law. I've freed you from the, the, the regulations. I've freed you from the Pharisees, from all those people. 
But Paul, of course, is not only referring to that. He's saying they get entangled again with the yoke of bondage, which is going back to the law, which could, we could never be free from until Christ died. So what Jesus taught was under the law. Three beautiful things I shared with some, a, a group of people this Sunday, and that is the law. The law made men guilty. The law made Christ righteous because he never failed one, and that's why the Pharisees always threw it at him. So what's the third one? The third one separated the nation of Israel because they were going to be the witnesses to go to the rest of them. And they could see, hang on, these guys are going to the synagogue on a Saturday. They must be Jews. They must be of the God of Israel, etc. And he's saying, don't go back to that because I've told you. I had a message revealed to me on the differences. And then, of course, Galatians 5.13. For brethren, ye, uh, brethren, you see that's a plural? You see that word there is a plural word. The and ye are two different words. One, in, case, in the case of being ye, is plural, and the is only singular. And you can't do it unless you use the King James Version, and people say, oh, but you want to take the these and the thous and the yees and the out of it. No, you don't ever want to do that. You're changing the, the language understanding. This is plural, ye. Galatians 5.13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. God says, I'm calling you to liberty. It's not something you're going to run around the corner and hide in liberty. I'm calling you to it. Live it. Have it. Enjoy it. And because you have it, don't get tied up in your mind that's going to tie you into bitterness and unforgiveness, etc. But do not go back into those things where you've been hurt. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Now, if you've got to forgive somebody, normally they have lived for an occasion to the flesh if they are Christian people or claim to be Christian. But remember, you can live to the flesh if you don't have rightly dividing dispensational consideration of the Bible because you don't know how you're forgiven, you don't know why you're forgiven, you don't sacrifice animals, you know Jesus died, but then you take everything before that and try to apply it to your life. And he says, yeah, but by love. Why? Because liberty is found in Christ's love. So how do we work with this um, and we don't go back to those things? Because of the love that we found, we serve one another. One another, does that mean we serve anybody at any time? No, we share the gospel with them. But he says, but by love serve one another. And who's he writing to? The Galatians in a little city called Galatia, um, a little town and whatever. And that's why he addresses it like this. We are bonded together in the liberty of Christ in a way that is indescribable because we both celebrate what ignites and absolutely blows the heart and mind when you see how beautiful God's grace, his forgiveness, his liberty is. And that's why I'm saying to you, please, my friends, don't get it wrong because it is the best way to live that Paul says live in the contentment contentment the mind is contented the mind is at peace your world can turn upside down but you know what you only need enough tools to get to the last breath in this world and you'll survive i promise you if you've ever had your business done in by somebody that actually wasn't right and i've had it i had it twice twice in a big way i'm talking big way i don't have to hold a grudge against anybody or a guy that lied I promise you, I worry about what he's going to say to the Lord one day because we're going to know the truth. We're going to know what thoughts there were in those that we have to forgive. I hope that makes your ability to forgive easier because can I tell you something? There is no doubt in my mind whatsoever. There's always going to be people we have to forgive. So what? So what? Have you found God's forgiveness? You're one of a handful of people. Do you rightly divide? Boy, you're one of a miniature number of people. If you can imagine every idle word you ever spoke, Christ forgave on the cross. You think you need to bother about somebody who's hurt you? I don't think so. I don't think so. Teach, teach, teach your children properly. Teach them not to become vindictive, not to become bitter and twisted. And I'm using harsh words here, but we live a real life. And that's what I love about our scriptures and I love about our Lord is that he's a realist. He's not a pessimist. He's not an optimist. He says, buddy, I wouldn't save you to heaven if this world was perfect for you. No, God doesn't speak to us like that, I know. But I'm trying to impose it on you because I celebrate it. I love it. I, I, I couldn't live without it. And I mean that honestly. Am I special because that? Absolutely not. 
I've just found something so special. And I hope that you do too. If you know the Lord's grace, there's a love we have. It's God's grace and the love. And when people understand the word of God correctly, I promise you it works effectually in their lives. First Thessalonians 2.13. Go read it. And until next time, should I be American? Amen. Oh, amen. <laughs> 